Okay, hello to everyone. Uh, dear participants, I welcome you all to this uh, second MCONSOL webinar. And you know, in the, the last years, the MCONSOL network organized four ENSO workshops. And as I mentioned already last week, we recently took some new steps in the expansion of our network and started with the organization of webinars on the theme of emerging contaminants in soil and groundwater. And as we had it uh, a week ago on PFAS, this uh, webinar will also be dedicated to the PFAS. And what's on the program for today? Well, it's certainly a very promising title. It's PFAS testing towards understanding awareness and impactful solutions. And I'm happy to announce that it's a rather unique situation because we have the competitors Eurofins and SGS have come together for a co-presentation. And of course, this points to the importance of uh, the PFAS topic. I will start with the introduction of the four experts we will hear today. First of all, uh, we have Anna Beheer. Anna is currently the project coordinator for one of Eurofins most important PFAS related projects a large scale human biomonitoring study for PFAS in blood in the region of Zwijndrecht. As you will see in the presentation, this project plays a critical role in the topic of PFAS testing. Second, we have Willem Volker. Willem is currently a business developer for PFAS analysis in Belgium and the Netherlands for Eurofins, and he aims to provide a diverse set of new customers with a full package of PFAS analysis in soil, water, air, and other matrices. Uh, also for Eurofins, we have Arthur Kolen. He finished in 2010 his Master and Study Analytical Chemistry at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. And since 2010, he works for Eurofins Omegam and has been involved in the development of new analytical methods, including PFAS. Finally, we have Luc de Ren. Luc works as a chemist and current business development manager within SGS. He's active in the environment related market already for more than 35 years. And as a former lab manager, as well as an environmental consultant, he is looking for analy analytical solutions in function of the question problems that clients are confronted with. And given his broad experiences with analysis, sampling, as well as regula regulations, he is well placed to support uh, uh, customers on the topics of water, waste, air, and of course also soil. More specifically around the PFAS topic, he helped form the basis of the SGS PFAS safe analysis strategy so that clients can build a much better picture of the PFAS topic. Um, we will have a presentation for some 40 minutes, uh, followed by a question round. Uh, questions, but also comments can already be noted in the chat. And to all of you, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johan, for the introductions. Let me just share my screen. Um, in the meantime, thank you for everyone uh, for coming. It's really, really great for us to see such a turnout today. It shows the uh, interest and uh, involvement in this topic. So over the next 40 minutes, as Johan said, we from Eurofins and SGS will tell you more about the critical role of PFAS testing in addressing the very concerning and widespread issue of PFAS pollution and the role that this testing can play in increasing our knowledge of the problem, stimulating awareness and leading to new impactful solutions. So who are we uh, with you today? We are Eurofins and SGS, both large international companies offering inspection, testing, certification and verification services uh, across all industries, but also, also with specific expertise in PFAS testing. Um, from Eurofins, we are Matthias, Willem, myself and Arthur. Arthur, myself and Willem are all in one location, so we'll be changing around during the presentation. Um, and it, I guess it's pretty obvious that we had to bring the entire young Eurofins delegation to compensate for all of Luke's experience um, and many years of expertise. Um, but as uh, Johan said, on a more serious note, it is a pretty unique moment and significant moment that such competitors come together for such a presentation. 
it really just points to the uh, immense importance of this topic and the uh, attention it really deserves. So we're going to start with a bit of an introduction into PFAS in environmental contamination and the really concerning routes that it takes uh, in the end to human uh, exposure. I'm certain all of you know what PFAS are, so I'm going to skip the section on the left of the slide, but you can refer if you're interested. What I think we need to make clear, however, is what is on the right. Where we are currently right now in the PFAS pollution topic is quite concerning. There's a lack of understanding in understanding in which areas PFAS pollution is a problem, all of the path pathways in which PFAS eventually reaches humans, and the matrices which we should all test for PFAS. There's also a lack of awareness in the wider population and in the public about the significant risks that PFAS really poses to their health and the health of those families, and of necessary actions which are being taken and should be taken. And there's a lack of defined impactful solutions to tackle local uh, and discovered areas of PFAS pollution, as well as regulation which is going to effectively prevent human and environmental exposure in the future and will essentially be critical in stopping the growth of this problem even further. Basically, um, where we are right now in PFAS, it's, it's like this well-known iceberg analogy. Really, we currently are at just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and considering the risk and the hazards to human health uh, that is posed by this class of chemicals, it's incredibly critical for us to understand the full picture. Um, and to do so, testing really will be key. Um, so I'm going to be handing over to Willem, who is going to explain a little more about the roots of human exposure to PFAS. Yes, thank you, Anna. So we're holding this webinar for people from all sectors that play an important role in the PFAS contamination that ultimately affects the health of us all. So it's good to realize what role each sector plays in causing human exposure to PFAS. There are different routes to human exposure, which can um, all start in industry. Chemical plants produce PFAS, which are then processed by other parties into products. During the production and processing, PFAS are released into the air and into rivers through wastewater. PFAS emissions from these sources are not confined to the few companies that you will see in films and documentaries on PFAS, but these emissions are widely spread across the continent, as you can see on this map on the left. Um, and the most important product that causes PFAS contamination of our soils and waters is firefighting foam. The concentrations of PFAS that we find at locations where firefighting activities have taken place are enormous, as you can see from this bar chart. Um, and consumer goods are a second product, which cause direct exposure to humans. Think of the wrapper of your hamburger or the paper straw through which your child drinks his lemonade. Well, that may all be true, uh, you may think, but if we just properly process PFAS through our waste infrastructure, we can get rid of it. In practice, that is not so easy, however, as PFAS are virtually indestructible and thereby destroying it is very hard and expensive. So what happens is that processed waste still contains PFAS and is then used to, for example, spray farmland where the crops grow that we eat. So we've seen that PFAS end up in our environment through industry, firefighting and waste. Um, and what happens uh, with these PFAS is then the question. As PFAS compounds are soluble in water, they are very environmentally mobile. So we, we find PFAS everywhere in the world. In our food labs, we encounter PFAS in fish, eggs and crops. And PFAS are even found in our drinking water. But while PFAS are everywhere, firms are still allowed to discharge PFAS in the rivers where the fish that we so like to eat swim. What does this mean for us in our daily lives? Who are affected by PFAS? Well, obviously the people that work at production plants and the people that live near these plants. It is for a good reason that the Flemish government has ordered a Eurofins led research into the blood of up to 90,000 people around a production plant near Antwerp. Also, firefighters who are repeatedly exposed to PFAS 
containing firefighting foams and wear turnout clothing with high levels of PFAS. But don't forget that even babies drink PFAS through the best breast milk of their very own mothers. Pregnant women drink more water than an average person, so according to the EPA, this leads to higher levels of PFAS in their bodies. Near a production plant in Dordrecht, all the breast milk of all 10 mothers who were sampled contained PFAS. And don't think that you yourself will be spared. Everyone has PFAS in their blood. Research among the general public concluded that 98% of Americans, for example, have detectable amounts of PFAS in their blood. So how important is this, you may ask yourselves. Scientific researchers are very clear on this. PFAS lead to significantly higher risks to numerous diseases. To name a few categories, reproduction problems, developmental defects in unborn children, cancers such as testicular and kidney cancer, and a weakened immune response. I think most of you will agree that the enormity of this problem means that decisive action is required and that it is urgent. So what should we do? We will need both government and business and we will need data. Data on what PFAS have we have in our soils and waters and what PFAS then eventually end up in our bodies. Anna is currently coordinating an impressive project, in my opinion, which is a prime example of generating data through government business cooperation. Yes, thanks, uh, Willem. So I'd like to tell you guys uh, a little more now about one of the most important topics um, and projects we have going on at Eurofins at the moment regarding PFAS. Starting uh, in the first quarter of 2023, Eurofins Belgium will be carrying out potentially the largest human biomonitoring study on PFAS in Europe. Potentially, we'll be testing the blood of 92,000 individuals for 16 PFAS components. This study has been ordered by the Agentschap Zorg en Gezondheid uh, from the Flemish government and will be carried out by Eurofins. So to give the background on how um, the Flemish government ended up at such a large um, and extensive study, um, see the bottom of the slides. Firstly, in June of 2021, a large PFAS contamination was detected in the soil and water surrounding uh, a 3M factory in the region of Antwerp. Based on this, um, the, there was interest to see where the uh, reach and the impact on humans was. So a first biomonitoring study was carried out on 800 individuals approximately, living in a three kilometer range around this factory. Very concerningly, an increase in PFAS concentrations was found in the blood of these participants. Um, even so that only one in 10 individuals that participated in this study are not expected to experience any health effects. And this was a very, very concerning finding, which led to the political decision to start a new biomonitoring project, which will offer 92,000 people living within a five kilometer range of the Antwerp 3M factory the opportunity to, taste their, uh, to test their blood. So following the blood sampling uh, procedure and periods, analysis will be carried out on 16 PFAS components. And in the end, in a statistical study, the PFAS levels will be linked to other data, including socio-demographic factors, which are uh, contained in a questionnaire given to all particip participants, clinical data and pollution data. The targeted outcomes are an increase in the understanding of the scope of the local problem. Where is the PFAS? What are the sources by which humans ingest it? And which matrices should we test further? Um, as well as this, it's going to lead to an increase in awareness in risk groups in the region, but also in the international community. This really is a, an incredibly large study and a, an example in the end for the European and international community um, on the connection between human biomonitoring and environmental uh, pollution topics. Um, and, and we hope to uh, lead to concrete solutions um, for sanitation measures and recommendations for legislation. So this really leads to following steps in PFAS testing. It's going to point to areas where further testing is needed in soil, water and other matrices as we better understand those tr transmission routes to humans. And these findings do not only count for this study, but can be extended to many other areas and future discovered areas of PFAS pollution. 
And so you think, OK, all these uh, PFAS testing um, that has to happen somewhere. This happens in laboratories of environmental testing companies such as Eurofins and SGS. And Arthur is now going to tell you a bit more about the technology of these analytics and how that is done in our labs. OK, thank you very much, Sana. Um, I will tell you something about the PFAS analysis in the laboratory. Um, as you already know, um, we do blood analysis, but however, we also do soil and uh, sludge, and we do water matrices in the environment. For this, we have specialized prep sample preparation extractions specialized for PFAS. For soil and sludge, this is shown here on the left side. We take a sample and we add an organic solvent. In the case for PFAS, we add basic acetonitrile and methanol. This will extract all the PFAS from the sample. However, it will also extract a lot of interfering compounds. These are called matrix compounds and can disturb your measurement. So after that, we do a cleanup, which is shown in the picture. This cleanup cartridge will contain all the interfering compounds, all the matrix compounds, while the PFAS will go through this cleanup column and elute into the glass tubes. After that, we can concentrate this and make uh, get an extract ready for measurement. For water, we have two different ways. The first way is shown in the middle. That is a solid phase extraction. This is specially developed for reaching very low detection limits. It also works with columns, as shown on the picture. However, these columns contain a different material. Contains a wax material that stands for weak and weak anion exchange. This will trap all the PFAS. So the water sample will go through the column and the PFAS will be contained on this column. This way we can reach very low detection limits. When you don't need these very low detection limits, you can also take an electrode from the water sample and di do direct injection into your instrument. What is very important when you do PFAS analysis? Very important is that you control the contamination. Contamination can be a big source of problems for your PFAS analysis. There are two big ways of introducing uh, PFAS contaminants. The first one is due to human interaction, shown on the left side. This can be uh, human interaction on a lab or when sampling your samples on the field. For example, personal care products, post-its or uh, fast food packaging, but also your clothing can contain PFAS. That is why our, all our people who are doing sampling in, in the field have been instructed what to wear and what not to wear and what to use and what not to use to make sure there are no contaminants introduced. At the lab, it's a bit more difficult because your, in, analyze, uh, your instruments which you're using for analysis, for example, the HPLC, the tubing, the bottles, the caps can also contain PFAS. That is why we often take blank measurements to make sure that all our instruments are clean of PFAS and do not introduce any kind of PFAS contamination. Very important is not to use any Teflon in the laboratory. Teflon is often used, but Teflon is built out of PFAS and will give you a lot of contamination. For sampling, we use specialized sample containers, which are shown here both for soil and for water. And these are known to be PFAS free and are regular tested. Two slides back, I showed you how to do the preparation of the samples. Then you get an extract. Then you have to do the measurement. How do we do the PFAS measurement? The PFAS measurement is done with an HPLC MSMS system. This system takes 20 minutes of time for one sample and contains an HPLC, which stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatograph, and this will separate all the individual PFAS compounds based on their polarity. The more polar compounds will elute earlier, and the less polar compounds will elute later. This is shown on the right side of the screen, where you can see all the different PFAS eluting. Then they reach the detector. For the detector, we use an MSMS, 
This is a mass spectrometer. This will ionize the PFAS and then detect, them, detect the PFAS based on their mass charge ratio. This has a very large advantage. If there is still interfering compounds present or still matrix compounds present, these interfering compounds will have a different mass charge ratio and will not be detected. By using this setup, we can do over 50 PFAS compounds and 25 internal standards within 20 minutes runtime. Also by using this setup, we can reach very, very low detection limits. Uh, that are called the limit of quantification. For water, these are below 1 nanogram per liter. And for soil, these are below 0.1 microgram per kilogram dry weight. Okay. Thank you, Arthur. Now we will uh, hand over to Luke, who is going to be discussing the PFAS uh, testing and the role it's playing within legislation. So I'm going to mute myself and Luke, you can. OK, I hope everybody hears me, perhaps sees me. Thanks for my colleagues of Eurofins and all. So thank you for Anna for putting the pressure on my shoulder. Because I've, as an old guy, I need to keep up with these young potentials, so I will try to do so. Uh, well, my slides are more to be seen like a kind of reflection, somewhat thoughts and, and, and certain remarks on how the things are running now in terms of PFAS. The first thing that you see there, that is what I see as, a, yeah, let's say a, a worrying thing, that is the alignment or the discrepancy between the techniques that actually we are using in the laboratories and we, which are mo in, in most of the labs the same, and what we see in terms of regulations nowadays. Uh, if we look at the water frame directive, which is already kind of an old uh, 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 European directive, you see that PFOS was mentioned as 0 0.65 nanogram, uh, whereas Arthur already mentioned that we are now using uh, less than one nanogram. You see that there is already there a uh, discrepancy. Also that the uh, US EPA, they mentioned about two, three months ago that they are going or aiming for a PFOA to 0.04 nanogram, which is uh, about, yeah, let's say 250 times lower than what we are actually obtaining. Yeah. So that is a kind of a, yeah, a difficult thing. Also what we see that in terms of the EU drinking water directive, which is a kind of a new one, it's determining a package of only 20 compounds in which they say that for each individual uh, compound, the, the sum of the individuals is 0.1 microgram, meaning five nanogram per each of individual of those 20. They stated also, and that is a kind of a new thing, which is, I think, a good one, that they, this is the first time that in official direct, uh, directive it is mentioned that the total PFAS in drinking water cannot be more than 0 0.5 microgram per liter. And that will lead to an analytical challenge because for the moment we see that the majority of the labs, they are using a target group of parameters. And if you do on average about 50 compounds, that means that you lose at least 3,950 3, others. So that is something that we need to take in, in, in mind. And one of the things, of course, that there is a tendency in lowering the uh, allowed uh, concentrations of a certain PFAS compound or a PFAS group. What will be the issues that we will be faced with as labs that if we are going for lowering the reporting limit, uh, that means that the labor intensity of a sample to treatment as already described by Arthur will be becoming more and more difficult and meaning that it will represent a, a, a huge cost. Additionally, that bear in mind that the lower the reporting limits for the labs that they must attain. Uh, so they will change a little bit their analytical protocols. It means that as soon as you have a sample that has a somewhat higher concentration, uh, one for 0 0.1 microgram can lead to a cross contamination to other samples. So that is a worrying thing. Uh, and then of course, if you go for the EPA 0 0.04 nanogram, that means that the chemicals that you are going to use uh, to determine that value, they must, of, must be of such a quality that we risk that we will have 
contamination only from those chemicals, those recipients, etc. So that is something that we need to take in mind that the more and more we lower the LOQ, the more and more problems that we will face in, let's say, false positive ones. And then for me, and that is more a remark or an open question, which is becoming for me a kind of a strange tendency, that is that we see that in the industrial discharge permits, there are more and more figures coming up who are lower than the drinking water quality. And that is for me a kind of a strange thing because that means that I can drink my water, but as soon as I pour that in the river, I will be penalized. That is for me a kind of a strange thing. Yeah, okay. And then, of course, what is what is important if we go for enforcement? And I know that the people from from the the, uh, the governments are also in this in this uh, webinar. Enforcement is a crucial one. Right? Enforcement is something that can be done only if you have laboratories able in producing re reliable and consistent results. That means as well that the laboratories must meet certain regulations or guidelines that if they are in place or are to come in place, that they are in line with those regulations. If we are talking on a European level, if for example, the European Drinking Water uh, Directive is talking about 20 compounds, that is quite clear. But we see that the composition, for example, the packages in the Netherlands or in Belgium or even in France, they differ. And that means that also for a lot of labs, it will be complicated to align their packages with what is in a local regulation. And I think also there that on a European level, there is a lot of homework to be done. Now, if we go for those very low reporting levels, you can see it as a pro, because that means that it will drive the market to reorganize themselves. And the market is the ones who are producing the uh, analytical equipment, as well as for the laboratories who need to do the sample cleanup and the analysis, that it will develop those type of, of uh, analytics. That is a very good one. The downside of it is, of course, that at this stage, it is for a lot of laboratories very unclear to which extent they need to invest in new equipment. Equipment that is, by the way, very costly. Eh? And then, I'm not a toxicologist and I don't think my colleagues from Eurofins as well, but I think we can open the question as well. Does it make sense to go lower and lower and lower in the LOQs that we are able to produce? And then given the question, is it from a toxicological point of view, does it still make sense that we deploy methods that are able to uh, show these uh, compounds in such, a, in such a low level? If we look to some cases, eh, we see uh, that the Netherlands, they are using their Rax Waterstaat package for about five years, and they are using that same package already for about those five years, and now they are re-evaluating those data sets to see did they make the right decision in terms of packages, do they need to change, do they need to add compounds, where we see that for the Flanders region, that the last half year, there have been so many numerous uh, uh, changes in those packages that also for the laboratories, it is very difficult to keep up the pace with the change in those packages. But also in terms of our customer, they are asking us, what do I need to analyze? Is it an indicative one? Is it a qualitative, quantitative one or vice versa? You see that a lot of yeah, open and unanswered questions are still there. If I look to the industry eh, for which also industrial effluents and emitting uh, waters need to be tested, the same type of questions are coming. Eh? In Flanders, we have Vlarem. Up to now and up to my knowledge, we have about 12 PFAS compounds for a concentration of 0.5 microgram per liter. But you see that the tendency is, is going lower and that is not always easy to serve uh, a certain market. If we see France, for example, yeah, there is it, it's really an open an open thing because there you see that nothing is is in place, and that the packages are even different differing from city to city. And my yeah, let's say appeal to to the, the authorities speak on European level and try to define a strict package for all of those regions for a certain uh, uh, reporting limit 
so that for the uh, laboratories who must uh, generate data for this enforcement, that they know what they are facing uh, on it. Okay. Next slide, please. Yeah. And then, of course, what are we talking about? If I look to the, 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 the blood project or the biomonitoring from my, from my colleagues, they are talking 60, 16 compounds. If we are looking at PFAS and food, ECA is talking of only four compounds. If we are looking into the target analysis for the Flanders, we are talking on average eh, 40 compounds. But that means that for the moment, we are losing information of at least 3,960 other compounds on which we do not have any view. Uh, so as already mentioned, the, the, the alignment within the regions and the countries is a necessity, including the laboratories from the beginning when the legislation is coming in place. I think that is really a crucial one eh, because if for example, EPA is saying we are going for 0 0.004 nanograms and the labs are not able to meet that. Yeah, then, then it remains a, a thing where, where you cannot uh, not enforce to. And then also what I want to see that this is the time where the PFAS is on the agenda. It's a sensible, uh, uh, sensible uh, 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 topic and also it's, uh, it's something that will be on the agenda for the next years. So my appeal is also there. Why not include additional techniques to open the discussion, not only to the target ones of the on average 40 compounds and what we are aiming for? Why not talking about a group parameter to say yes or no, there is a lot of an organofluorine in a certain matrix, being in it water, being in it uh, uh, soil or waste or whatever. If we see that there is a non-presence, you can already say, OK, there is a minor or no problem. If we see that there is from an organic fluorine uh, concentration point of view, uh, an elevated concentration, you can go to the target analysis as explained by Arthur. If there we see that we are in alignment with the organofluorine, we have explained that the PFAS that are present, they are well determined. But we are talking in some cases of 3,960 non-evaluated. And then we go to a top assay to try and show that is that increase of organofluorine due to the fact that precursors or other PFAS are present. We are going to do an oxidation on a lab scale. Two possibilities, or we do not see an increase and you can be sure that there is no other risk or you see a significant increase in PFAS, and then you know that also precursors are present. If we see, for example, AFFF, eh, there is a transition period in place now for the firefighting foams where they need to go to fluorine-free foams. We see that still today, a lot of those foams do not contain 40 of these target PFAS compounds, but if we do an OF organofluorine and we do a top assay, we see then that the results are really going to the roof. And then you have highlighted that those type of materials, they contain PFAS related uh, contaminants, which in the long run will give you an, uh, a, a PFAS risk. And to close down, the long run is for me, perhaps even on a short term, because what we have seen that, for example, if you have a wastewater treatment plant and you determine at the beginning PFBA, you will not find it in a lot of cases. But after the wastewater treatment plant, you all of a sudden see PFBA. So that means that biology is already possible or, or capable in cutting down those uh, uh, precursors, leading to an increase of those PFBAs. Some of the reflections that we would like to give uh, in terms of the analytics. Thank you, Luke. Um, I think this really uh, highlights the importance uh, for the collaboration on the PFAS testing and regulation. And with this, uh, we would like to summarize with just reflecting on the role of PFAS testing in this bigger picture. If my slide will move, yes. Um, Really, the main takeaway here is that PFAS testing is uh, is and will be remainingly critical in leading to greater understanding 
um, greater awareness and solutions within this topic. And this will impact all parties active in this landscape, but we can see that knowledge and understanding uh, is in primarily in the benefit of the experts. Awareness, we speak of the public and the risk groups, and solutions in the end are a collaboration between regulators, industry, and parties that can implement these solutions. Um, and we hope strongly that uh, laboratories will get a place in, uh, in the um, uh, process of designing such solutions. It's clear that PFAS testing is an important step in moving forward. Um, and we would like to leave you with the message or the appeal to really recognize where the responsibility lies within this issue and to collaborate on this topic moving forward, um, especially with laboratories who are performing the PFAS testing. Um, so on that note, I would say we can we can go for questions. Um, we will crowd around and hopefully we can answer uh, all of the questions that may have come up. Uh, thanks to to all of you. This uh, was really an interesting presentation with a uh, with a nice mix of of uh, different uh, questions on uh, the the PFAS analysis, but also on uh, yes some challenges we have. Uh, to, to match uh, our uh, analysis um, and also what we need to have as detection limits and what otherwise is really necessary for a society to, to measure and uh, how we uh, um, make up uh, a an, an risk assessment on, on uh, the basis of these uh, analyses. Um, so there are certainly uh, a lot of um, information that was given that can give rise to to, uh, to a nice discussion. But uh, let's first start with the um, with the questions that have been raised in the chat. But you still have the possibility because this was a presentation nice in time. Uh, so we have also uh, sufficient time to have a, a discussion about uh, this topic. I'll start with uh, the first question that was coming from Ilse van Keer. Um, she asked which 16 PFAS will be analyzed, and I have seen that there was already an answer for that. The second part of the question, uh, on what criteria that these 16 were chosen, I don't know if this does uh, that Eurofins can um, answer, or is this something that was uh, just uh, questioned by by uh, AZG, so the Agentschap Zorg en Gezondheid. Is someone from Eurofins who wants to come in and uh, elaborate on that uh, second part of the question? Um, I think I can start to make the answer, and if Matthias um, would like to uh, complement. Um, the primary uh, study conducted in the region of the 3M factory in Antwerp um, showed numbers of a P, uh, many different PFAS components and uh, as a result of this those um, those 16 PFAS were chosen. Um, I think that's a, that's a finding from the, the first study that those are the ones to be focusing on for this larger uh, biomonitoring study. Okay, thank you. Um, then a more general question, of course, why do different laboratories have different detection limits? Uh, at the state there, we have seen uh, uh, less than the half micrograms per kilogram, others have then less than one, uh, 0 0.1 micrograms per kilogram. Does this depend on the soil sample? This is also the question. Who wants to answer this? Yes, I think I can answer that. Um, no. Does not completely depend on the soil samples. Some soil samples are more difficult, then you have increased uh, limits. But the main reason is that they will be using different preparation techniques, uh, different amount of soils, different amount of liquids, different kind of instruments. For your analysis, you can use different kind of HPLC and SMS, and some are, some are more sensitive than other, others. Well, that, that is, I think, one of the answers. I think, secondly, that you must take in account that, for example, it will be region depending. Uh, for example, for the Flanders, we see that the 0 0.5 is something that was mentioned in the, in the CMAs, whereas in the Netherlands region, 0 0.1 was used. So it will be more dependent on the region where you are, you are working in that will more or less define whether you're going for the 0 0.1 or the 0 0.5. 
And in addition, if I see that yeah, the, the, the lower limits that were asked in, in Flanders are, I think, 8.8 8, uh, uh, microgram per kilogram. So if it is 0 0.1 or 0 0.5, you are well below that 8, uh, that 8 micrograms. So that's, yeah. And that is open open to the discussion, as I just mentioned, also for for uh, for uh, the water. Does it make sense to lower your LOQ for soil if if if, if the the value is eight? And so it will cost you perhaps somewhat more time. You will spend somewhat more chemicals or whatever. So, yeah, it's it's dependent on the things that we just uh, just said. Uh, yeah. And there's a question from uh, Ilse van Kier also from from Vito. Uh, PFAS analyzed in water samples. Uh, detection limits and reporting limits are not the same for all individual PFAS. Uh, but then, what what is the order of magnitude of very low detection limits? Well, I think that Arthur has already mentioned that they are. Uh, going for one nanogram and we are going for 0 0.5. So the order of magnitude is the same. The only thing, eh, if EPA is going for 0 0.004 nanogram, that means that your sample preparation will be in another order of magnitude. Eh, whereas we now are going to tackle uh, or, or do the sample prep with, let's say, on average 20, 30 milliliters, you need to perhaps use a half of a liter in the sample prep. And that will lead to other problems as well. But it's just a matter of what is legislation about, how are labs going to meet that legislation, and sample prep will be will be based on that on that regulation. Huh? Okay. Um, then a question also because you mentioned it, the four picogram per uh, per liter from the EPA. Uh, look, um, the question is for what stands the EPA guideline value? Is it for drinking water? Is it the quality standard? Uh, well, it, it will be more or less like the, the, the water frame directive uh, type of thing, eh, where, where we are talking about 0 0.65 nanogram per liter. The, the proposal for the EPA was in a kind of an equivalent of the, uh, the water frame directive to go for that 0 0.004. And we have also in the US, we have yeah quite performant laboratories, and their first remark was as well how the hell I should say are we going to meet that 0 0.004 you can easily pronounce that but it's very difficult to have that result on paper eh? it's also interesting to see because uh, the REVM uh, recently published also some more quality standards for surface water and there we also uh, are going into the range of the the picogram yeah. per, per liter um, so it's a little bit uh, similar of course but uh, the status of, of these uh, surface water quality standards is for the moment not so not clear, I think, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, next question is coming from Hendrik Plas from uh, Tractable. What's the difference between qualitative and indicative uh, parameters? It must be quantitative and indicative. Uh, it was uh, mentioned in your presentation. Luc, can you uh, broaden on that? Yeah, uh, well, what what we are saying that if you are going to do well, it's it's a little bit like the ones who know the AOX from the past or the AOX that we are using for water. It's about uh, about the same strategy. In the past, we have used AOX as a, a kind of a guide parameter to show if there are organohalogens in a soil or in a waste. It's kind of the same thing instead of AOX, it's now AOF, eh, where we are going to uniquely are going for an organofluorine compound and not for the halogenated ones. Also for the water ones, where we are talking AOF instead of AOX. So they will give you in an order of magnitude if, if it is present or not. If you go for the very low ones, and then we're talking the nanogram, then you need to go for target analysis. And so I think people must understand that within the approach for revealing the presence or absence of the group of PFAS compounds, that the OF will be more an order of magnitude thing, the target will be used for a risk evaluation thing, and the top assay will again also in an order of magnitude be used to confirm whether or not it is a PFAS related increase of OF or not. Yeah. Next question is an interesting one uh, from Carol Guggenheim. Um, it's, a, it's a general question, of course. How about going to a more effect-based analysis of PFAS mixtures instead of target analysis, some parameter analysis? It always has been a challenge, of course. We have uh, 
also from the regulator side to put to the to the laboratories can be get more effect based analysis. Um, what's the reaction from from both of uh, of you, Eurofins and uh, SES on that? Well, to, to me, to me, it makes sense in the way that we have been granted a European uh, a, a project where this is one of the things that we are going to test for. And we are going to do ecotox testing on individual PFAS, but also see if we combine certain of those PFASs, what is the effect then on an ecotoxicological basis? And then, of course, and that will be the challenge for the next years. Eh? I, I hear and more and more that also VMM is in favor of ecotox testing rather than doing individual analysis. Um, we are already talking that uh, about that for a long time. Uh, yeah, it must be seen how this is going to happen. Uh, but it's it's a, indeed something that will be tested in the, yeah, the next year, uh, one and a year uh, and a half uh, on, on this effect. Eh? Arthur, perhaps you? Yeah, I think quite the same way. I don't think I have that much to add. I think this is mainly, of course, a ch choice uh, from the norms which way we are going. And that has to be, that's why it's so important that labs are involved, that we can already prepare our an analysis based on what the, the norms here we are going to follow. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen Boussard asked a question, is there a list of plants, vegetables that don't accumulate PFAS? I don't know if you're as experts on laboratory techniques can answer that question. The, the only thing that I can add that I, that I know now Hennep very well and that and that we do know that it accumulates those PFASs, but we have been do, we've been involved in other projects where a limited number of, of, of plants have been tested and nearly all of them, they absorbed PFAS. The only thing, for example, I don't know the English word for uh, William. Uh, Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, uh, I, we see that those uh, absorb PFAS or uh, yeah, via the water. And what we saw that there is a difference in absorption if you have a young plant or an, uh, or an older one. And I think that has more to do with the, the, the number of liters that they will absorb from the soil rather than with the material as such. But for the moment in, in grasses, in, in, in leaves, uh, in, in whatever, we have found it. And I'm sorry, but I'm not a biologist to say which are not accumulating these. Eh? Someone from Eurofins who wants to add something to this? Yeah, I mean, um, we don't, I don't, and I think us here don't know of any specific plants which would not accumulate PFAS. Um, it's, it's of course through the absorption of the water and through the soil and in the way that plants are uh, requiring water, um, uh, they will all absorb PFAS to some extent. Um, and this is why it's truly very concerning. Okay. Thank you. Next question is, what about bioavailability of uh, PFAS in soil samples? I think that is indeed a very good question, uh, and, and that leads also to the deployment of other methods, which I've already mentioned. Uh, what about short chains? Uh, is that something where we put where we need to put a lot of money in it in the deployment of those type of, of analysis? Uh, again, I'm not a toxicologist, but I can imagine that due to the fact that these type of compounds are so water soluble, uh, is it then necessary to, to de determine them? But again, that is something that we cannot answer to. We can just deploy or not a certain methodology. And for sure, the bioavailability of a PFAS, what I think, but, but that's more a gut feeling, as they are so uh, uh, water uh, or water soluble, I think that the uh, bioavailability of those type of things is rather high. That's my opinion, but again, it's more gut feeling than, than based on, on, on analytics and, and scientific approach. Huh? Then the question, okay, Anna, you want to add something? Yeah, shortly. Uh, of course, depending on the, the, the chain length and the polarity of the PFAS um, accumulating in, in different areas within uh, humans as well. Um, so it really also depends. It's, of course, a, a class of over 6000 compounds. So within this, there are massive differences in the bioavailability as well. Okay. 
Um, then a question coming back to re reliability of analysis. What's the relevance, sense or nonsense of analyzing Duplos? Well, I think that that leads to a lot of questions, to, to, to a lot of discussions that we have, not only on PFAS, but also on other type of analysis. Eh? If we see that the comparison of, for example, a basic TPH analysis between different labs, you already see there that there are yeah, let's say differences. Um, what we see that in, in this case, eh, water is a yeah, pretty good homogenized uh, matrix where the reproducibility of the results will be quite good. Although there, there are also some reflections that we can make. I, I would come to that one. But for soil there, we see that it's already much more complicated. Eh? If we see that uh, one consultant is, is is on the same site taking a sample and the second consultant is coming a, a few days later on that same site. The sample heterogeneity will be an important one. Uh, and uh, if, if you want to take a, a soil sample, it's not just making a drilling hole of 100 millimeters uh, in, in diameter. Yeah, if you want to have a homogenized site, uh, sample from a site, yeah, you, then you need to make cubic meter samples. You need to homogenize it and then it goes to the lab. What the lab receives is about two, three hundred grams of a sample. We are going to homogenize that in the lab, in the lab as best as possible, and then we do analysis. But yeah, measurement uncertainty only on the analytics as such for this type of compounds is around 30 to 40 percent on the sample as such. That means if you are going to take in account the sampling, etc., easily talking between 50 to 100 eh? percent. I also think that it is very important that you uh, make general rules for all labs about the quality controls, because some labs have, for example, we have now uh, more than 20 internal standards, but all labs can have less. So that can be also an influence of difference. OK, uh, now, next question is, is perhaps one of the things that I would like to add in terms of what we see if we do analysis on water. We see that there is in the uh, the WAC and the CMA, there are a number of compounds measured. And what we see that is, for example, a 6.2 FTS, which is present in the firefighting foams, is not an easy one. Eh? I think the Vito people who are in this call can confirm that. That is something on a really unexplainable way. Eh? In each lab, we all have problems with 6.2 FTS. It will come up and it will go down in the same sample after a few days. That's one thing. So that is a kind of a problem problem one which we cannot yeah, put a finger on it. For example, if you have a wastewater sample and you're going to do PFBA today and you do not find it and you do on the same sample after you, a few days and you see that the microbiological mix is, is in that good order that it cuts down those pre, uh, precursors that you will see that after a few days you all of a sudden find PFBA. So it's a complex one and, and again under the conditions of a test try to interpret what your lab is, is offering and it's not always yeah the lab has done a, an erroneous uh, result. It's more like some things are rather unpredictable uh, unfortunately. Uh. Okay. Well, we have still some questions, so we'll try to handle them. Is there already a method for the legibility of PFAS? I understand that question because if we uh, install the new framework uh, for triggering values in Flanders, that will be an important one. Well, up to my knowledge, there is nothing really defined in, in what will be used as in terms of leachability. Yeah, you see, we have uh, uh, the, the single step 24 hours. We have the two step leaching procedure. We have a column testing, etc. I think the only thing that we must be prudent on that if we are going for the more complex type of leaching procedures, the more risk that you enter in such a type of a sample pretreatment, entering additional uncertainties in terms of uh, col uh, contaminations. Eh? If we do, for example, a 24 hour sampling of a wastewater, and you have an equipment, you can rinse it at good as possible that you want. But if it's coming from a plant that has high res uh, concentrations of PFAS, you go going to place it in, in, in an installation where there is none. You will always see that cross contamination is a daily uh, issue with material, not only in the lab, but also in terms of the field. Huh? OK, um, next question is, will EOF identify the presence of precursors? 
example, I think we have answered that. But the answer is, will it reveal the presence of an elevated organofluorine? Yes, it will do so. The only thing is only based on AOF or AOF, AOF, you cannot make the presumption that it is a precursor. There is an indication that it is, and you can only confirm that if you do a top assay afterwards. And if you then see that you see an increase in those PFOA related new perfluorinated formed compounds, then you are sure that the elevated organofluorine is coming from a PFAS. If it is not increasing, then it is non PFAS related, but only on AOF AOF. That is not enough to say that it's for sure precursor. It can give you an answer yes, it's an elevation of organofluorine but not 100% sure that it, it's a precursor. Huh? Yes, OK, the, the, the two next messages in the chat have to do with, uh, first of all, answer to the question about the, the what are the EPA guideline value stands for, then HENEP could be a remediation technique, I think. And then uh, are there individual PFAS analyzes available or can we only analyze PFAS in a package? Well, of course, you can just report one, but that is just about how you set up your system. Uh, normally, you use an um, HVLC, a measurement system, and detect all the PFAS you want. That is why you set up your uh, target screening to include all the different PFAS. If a customer wants, we can always say, okay, we report only one. But in general, at our lab, it is not, uh, we Analyze them all, and it's not really worth it to make an analysis only for one compound. And to and to be kind of boldly, I think this kind of question is coming. Can we cut down the costs or not? Yeah, well, the cost will be indeed uh, to, uh, to add to that. The cost will be still the same because yeah. it's the same preparation, it's the same analysis. Um, yeah. Only thing that will be different instead of uh, checking your quality controls for all the compounds you will check only one compound but that is not the most amount of cost because the most amount of cost will still be your instruments the sample measurement the preparation yeah and and, and what i can add to that if you see for example for the a triple f's the firefighting phones there is an eu regulation who is saying a firefighting foam cannot have more than 25 microgram per kilogram p4 if the producer of his foam says do an analysis of only P4, he can meet, he can meet that regulation. But if the firefighter is using that foam and it contains a lot of other PFASs and you did not analyze it for it, then you're creating a new contamination. And that's why I always say if you have a firefighting foam, I, I'm willing to do only P4, but I will never say it's a PFAS free foam. Okay. There are still two questions in the in the chat, uh, but it's uh, two o'clock. I, I uh, want to stick to to the time frame we normally have one of one hour. So I would invite uh, the presenters if they can have a look at those uh, questions. And um, the questions from Ilse van Keren, from Steven Boussard, that you can uh, react to them uh for what what uh, what's in there and also um the chat from from Steve, uh, stefan uh this webinar has been recorded and it will be available tomorrow so don't have to look immediately by the over youtube uh, channel so with this i want certainly to thank all the presenters uh first of all for the interesting presentation but also for the where they have showed a lot of expertise in answering the many questions we had in in the chat um so thank uh, to you uh, all also thanks for the organization um that's uh, from the ovam side Nele Bal and Stefan van Gierenhoven and also Wim van der Driessen from the Association of uh, Remediation Experts in Flanders and finally I want to introduce you to the program of next week Thursday that's the third webinar and there will be two topics the treatment of PFAS contaminated rinse water and the second topic is the remediation of PFAS contaminated contaminated soils where we have will have a brief literature review uh, and that will be the program for uh, next week uh, Thursday so um, I want to thank you all and have a nice day and see you next week okay thank you very much
Have a nice Thank day. You. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.